always respected people who can say a lot with a little. I probably developed that appreciation from my classical Greek professor at Wake Forest University, the late Dr. Carl B. Harris. He liked everything cogent and concise. The 8th century prophet Micah has been labeled a minor prophet. His is a thin little book, so it must be a minor prophecy. Poor little Micah's work from Moresheth is a review or an abstract or an article stacked up to Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel. But in this little work of prophecy, there is a big message on this day of our annual meeting. Micah tells us clearly in one summarizing verse what it is that the almighty and merciful God desires for us. And what does the Lord expect from those whom God has chosen? Very simply, the Lord says that we are, one, to do justice, two, love kindness, and three, walk humbly with our God. What the Lord desires for us is nothing less than a refocusing of our lives. This is no trite to-do list, but it's three dimensions of a faithful life rooted in God's prior track record of faithfulness to us. We are called to do justice. For too many, Justice is narrowly understood as punishment deservedly handed out to criminals and terrorists. That's the first thing we think of when we hear the word justice. True, there is an element of justice that draws a plumb line between right and wrong to protect the weak from the strong. But from a broader biblical perspective, justice signifies God's ordering for the whole of life. To do justice is to order every area of life in accord with God's will. Public officials with constituents, family with tribe and kinfolk, community with the refugee, congregation with the poor and lost. For God's chosen people, justice means to care for the orphan and widow, to welcome the stranger, to feed the hungry, to make room for the homeless and resident alien, not because those who have the scales of injustice against them deserve it, but because this is the way God has already acted favorably with Israel and us in the past. Doing justice is a matter of perspective. To love your neighbor is not a psychological feel-good act. Justice is the claim of the neighbor's need upon us. It means I am to love my neighbor and stand by my neighbor as if he or she were another I. I am to love my neighbor as if I were in my neighbor's place. I am to come to the aid of my neighbor as if I were standing in my neighbor's shoes. Doing justice is also a matter of balance. It means to borrow from the words from the ELCA Hunger Appeal, to live more simply so that others may simply live. It means grappling with what is the fair share for my own needs and wrestling with the question of where needs cross the frontier into wants. How many of you have had that conversation 
around your kitchen table before. Earlier in Micah's little book, justice is expressed as a balanced condition when they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees without fear of seizure or envy. What is a vineyard and some fig trees? My grandparents in South Carolina, my grandfather was a hard-working carpenter. And at one point, he was able to afford five acres of land in that portion of South Carolina that had fruit trees. The cheapest land was next to the railroad track, so it came by at 2 o'clock in the morning. A little frame house with four rooms, and he felt that it was his castle. Is that what we mean by a, the right amount for us and how we live together in this world? What is a vineyard and some fig trees? A fair paying job, a modest home, a decent hybrid car? and an honest-to-God tithe for the mission of the church. Balance focuses on how far we need to go with what God has entrusted to us to tip the balance for the cause of the neighbor in need. But the cry for justice sounds shrill and overly disoriented without enduring relationships day-to-day -day commitment to small promises and a heart for reconciliation to live together. We are called to love kindness. Kindness is probably too anemic a word for the translation from the Hebrew here. The word is kesed, steadfast love, steadfast commitment. The biblical picture looks more like a solid marriage or enduring friendship. Making commitments and keeping commitments. Justice always needs to be tempered by mercy. Our bold deeds and strong voices need the constant awareness that even in good causes and righteous exertion, we harbor the capacity to hurt and to patronize other people. To love in a steadfast manner means to share the pain and joy of others. To love tenderly means to acknowledge our own dependency on others for gifts tangible and intangible. We who are pretty well off in where we live, this is difficult for us to do. My mother was tough on me at times when I was a kid when people were giving me things and she said, you need to take it and say thank you. You need to be a gracious receiver. You need to acknowledge that you are dependent on other people and other people are dependent upon you. Dear friends, the Lord's good desires could sound awfully like a prescription for physical, mental, and spiritual burnout. When you think about it, do justice, love, kindness, holy smoke. That's a big assignment. That would be so without the third dimension of the journey. We are called to walk humbly with God. Without God's sustenance of word and sacrament, our just and enduring relationships cannot endure. To walk humbly with God means to take a deep breath and place our ultimate trust in the Lord as the firm base from which we conduct all our just and merciful operations. To walk humbly means to place all our justice attempts and failures to love tenderly into the hands of a love who will not let us go. At the altar table, around the kitchen table, with well-worn Bible in hand, among encouraging friends, 
we walk humbly with God's wisdom, provision, and forgiveness. God may set high expectations before us to do justice and to love kindness, but God also walks with us, even ahead of us, going ahead of us, making the way and asking us to come behind. This final desire makes possible the fulfillment of the other two, albeit imperfect. With what shall I come before the Lord? With what shall we as a congregation come before the Lord? The short answer is that the Lord doesn't need anything from us. We don't need to bribe God. If you read in the early part of this lesson, that's what it talks about. God has already saved us. God has already claimed us eternally. That work has already been done. Okay. So having said that, what does the Lord desire for us now, today, here, in this place, and beyond these walls? He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly. 